Hi, I'm Adam Zawarowski. I'd like to welcome you on, the be on behalf of the Department of Economics and Business at, here at CEU. Uh, welcome you to this series of public talks on the economics of populism, which is co-organized by CEU and the Civica Network. So we have uh, three distinguished speakers from three different universities at Civica. Um, importantly, what we are trying to convey is economic insights or how an economist thinks about populism and, and related issues, but it's not only for economists. So importantly, I think the economics, uh, in understanding the economic thinking or the economic aspect of, uh, of these issues is also very important for understanding our society. So this is the second in our talk of series. The first one was in January and was offered by Sergei Guriev from Sion Spo on the political economy of populism. You can see the recording on our CEO's YouTube channel if you missed the talk. Today's will be given by Massimo Morelli on, given its consequences, can populism be long lasting? Sorry, I see the title is slightly different. Will populism persist given its causes and consequences? And the third talk will be given on March 22 at the same time, uh, same place, also followed by the reception by CU's uh, item Seidel on the political economy of alternative realities. And both today and, uh, and in March, there'll be a reception that follows. So I do invite you to come to uh, the back here and join us for the reception. And also encourage you to sign up for our departmental uh, news where we announce similar events and, and blog posts. So I, I'm really happy to have uh, uh, Professor Massimo Morelli here. Um, so Massimo is a professor of political economy at uh, the Bocconi University. He holds a PhD from Harvard. And for many years, he was a professor of political science and economics at Columbia University before returning to his alma mater uh, Bocconi as a professor. Same for me, I was also a CU student and then came back, so I, I, know, I know it, and there are several others. In, in, in. Um, you know, there's a, uh, Massimo has a lot of different roles and jobs. He's council member of the European Economic Association. Uh, he has uh, won an ERC grant a few years back, and I just looked at his publication list. It is really impressive. Just in the past few years, uh, publishing in both uh, poli top political science and top economics journals like the American Journal of Political Science, Political Analysis, American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy. Uh, so I'm sure you're here not to hear from me, but to hear from Massimo. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Massimo. So we'll do a talk of about 40, 45 minutes, then there's 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. And basically, don't worry if you couldn't ask, ask your question in public, there's still an opportunity at the reception. So, Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm very happy to be here to give this public lecture because I've been working on this topic on the political economics of populism for a number of years. And now it's the time, in fact, to put together all these things and try to connect the dots. So, on this slide on questions, I tell you what are the four things that you should expect to hear from this talk. The first one is uh, you, you will get some uh, of my ideas about why uh, we are in a populism wave at this point. Of course, populism is not new, but it's particularly acute in Western democracy at this point. The second type of message that I will try to convey is that we can have a unified understanding, rationalization of why people, both voters and politicians, choose to become populist in a sense that you will see, and about why and about what type of political strategies those who become populist on the politician side uh, decide to use. The third is the most important thing for the question at hand is what are the consequences? There is a, a growing literature on what are the consequences of having populism wave and, and especially populists in office. And the last one is more speculative about the future. 
what does the answer to these first three questions tell us, tells us in terms of whether the wave of populism that we are facing is something that should be considered a temporary wave or should indicate a persistent and permanent shift in politics. Okay? So the definition of populism that you should keep in mind, which is shared by uh, many uh, items and, and, and uh, voices on the encyclopedia, etc. cetera, uh, so it's the most widespread definition of populism, is, is refers to what makes a politician a populist more than what makes a voter a populist. Right? So we, we should focus that when we are talking about a populist, most uh, often we should think about what is a populist politician, because then the voters are simply choosing what platform to, to follow more than becoming a populist. Okay? So what is a populist? More or less a populist politician is defined as someone who uses a rhetoric um, pro-people, protection of people, anti-elite, right? So blaming the elite for everything and, and claiming that they can protect the people and thereby pandering, as they say in economics, to the fears and enthusiasm of people without much regard for the future consequences of the policies they promise. <laughs> Therefore, in a nutshell, you should think that these are two components of, of a populist, namely the rhetoric, so the anti-elite pro-people rhetoric is very common at the communication level, etc., to even use just that as a measure of populism, and the commitment to protect, which is a bit like the more novel component that I'm emphasizing much more than other people do. So uh, in terms of the political science literature, they do uh, measure populism mostly on the first dimension. Because you can measure it on texts, on political texts, on manifesto. You can go check whether indeed the party shifts to that type of rhetoric. And so it's, more, it's what political scientists use, more or less, to define whether a party is populist or not, etc. But as I will argue in this lecture, it's very important to focus on the second dimension to understand better both the causes and the consequences of populism. Therefore, the type of commitments that uh, you can already start thinking about would be things that range from policy commitment, like building walls, closing borders, closing markets, Brexit, exit from institutions, all the way to identity types commitments. Okay? So, now I introduce the key variable that will allow me to rationalize the connection between those two elements of populism. The key variable is trust. Okay? Why? Because it links the current times we, let, we, we lived in in the last 20 years to the change in politics that we are talking about. The various crises from uh, uh, um, globalization, uh, financial crisis, etc., created distrust through economic insecurity, as I argue in a few papers. And uh, distrust was also increased by the difficulty that institutions and government institutions in particular uh, had in responding to those crises. So therefore, contrary to, in contrast with the past, the distrust these times is more or less symmetric uh, in terms of being both distrust in markets, think about you know, not being afraid now of global markets, all the way to distrust in government that they don't really succeed in fixing the problems. And given this distrust that is more pervasive, and there are lots of surveys showing that distrust is more or less parallelly going up, distrust in politicians, parties, institutions, and even generalized distrust. In this environment where you can think of a general tendency towards lower trust in everything, it be, it's natural to think that when a voter is choosing a representative agent, uh, uh, is less okay with giving the agent free hand. And he might prefer to have simple uh, you know, policy commitments that he or she can monitor, rather than giving that dangerous free hand to the representative agent. Here are a few examples, if I'm on the right example slide, about these types of commitments that have emerged. 
The Five Star Movement is a good example because you have in, uh, in their uh, quote-unquote platforms over the last uh, decade on and off, these five types of commitment that relate to, the, to this trust. The first commitment is a citizenship income, which is a, a, a policy, a simple policy that is easy to monitor for voters. Either you give me the citizenship income or you don't. And the other four are about are confirming that this type of commitments are in order to uh, mobilize those that otherwise wouldn't vote because they don't trust anybody. What, what are they? Well, they are commitment like, oh, we will be in office only at most two terms, two terms so we don't really care about the political armchairs, and uh, we, we are even in favor of, uh, of, of cutting the pay of elected members of parliament, we are even in favor of reducing the number of members of parliament as it happened in a referendum because we, 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 we want to shrink the, the, the political caste. And indeed, we want to punish any elected uh, member of parliament in our movement who deviates from the, from the Grillo mandate, from the centralized mandate of the, of the uh, populist movement. So these are, you know, it's a clear set of, exa of, of uh, within a party uh, uh, things that, that relate to that commitment I mentioned. And the second example, of course, is Trump, but where the, the commitments are a bit more vague, but are pretty strong. America first, no matter what, protectionism, building a wall, and going against any attempt by the media, the bureaucracy, or international organizations to stop the America first type commitment. And to see how we can generalize this example, we are, we, before generalizing, we, we, we zoom on one uh, specific type of tweet that you might find uh, uh, representative of what I mean by commitment. This is a tweet by Salvini, uh, the Northern League, or the League now, and it says, basically, hey, I'm, your, I'm the champion, I'm your champion of uh, protection against external threats. I'm the one who closed the borders, I fight for you, I will never give up. Okay? And this is the most frequent type of tweets that you would find from this type of politicians. We took uh, uh, these this examples seriously and we started a work that is in progress with, uh, with, with some co-authors um, to actually measure uh, and verify that this is true beyond these simple examples. So in the US, we were able to uh, use the existing surveys on trust to geolocalize them, so to speak. So across districts where politicians run or across constituencies where politicians run, you can measure, even though the, the trust surveys are every number of years, three or four, I forgot, so they're not every year or every, every month, they're not frequent, but you can still have a panel, and, and it says uh, basically how trust varies across districts, and so what we wanted to check is whether it was true or not, and indeed it is true, that in the districts where politicians run, uh, that where this trust is high, the tweets, the collection of tweets, that, and we have millions of them, of politicians that are running for office indeed display more commitments and more anti-elite rhetoric style. Okay? And moreover, just to be consistent, we show that when uh, 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 there is entry of a populist who uses those strategies, in particularly distrustful districts, turnout goes up with respect to the case in which a similar district or that, or that district in the past didn't have a committed delegate running for office. So this gives us a, a, some confidence that beyond the examples, this thing about commitment is, is real and, and important, and now we will analyze uh, a bit more in detail uh, what happens and why this gives us uh, uh, a better comprehension of the phenomenon. So a bit, uh, a, a small detail about the theory why trust matters. This, I want to just to give you a simple intuition. Trust matters because 
when a voter is choosing a representative agent in, in a representative democracy, ideally the voter would want someone competent and congruent with her own objective. Uh, and in that case, with a competent and congruent type as a representative agent, you would want to give such an agent free hand. Because the state of the world may change tomorrow, there will be another crisis, there will be some other kind of priority lists, and maybe the commitments today are not good. However, here where, where comes trust. If I don't trust that this representative, or in general the political class, is congruent with voters' objectives, and they may be derailed by interest groups and, and by a, a vague notion of an elite out there that manipulates, then I want commitment. Then I want to have something tangible. I don't want to give free hand to anybody. So that's, to repeat, that's the main idea. The typical trade-off that this uh, thing uh, represents is about protectionism, for example. Right? So you, you, sometimes protectionism is the good thing because maybe there is already a trade war. You have to use trade sanctions uh, against, uh, against uh, someone who, who would be sensitive to those trade sanctions, etc. But in some other cases, protectionism is really bad. And by, by giving up free trade, you give up a lot of cooperative outcomes. Right? And, and so you would want to, to give free hand on that, but if you don't trust, but if you think that, that in any case, whenever you will hear, yes, we'll keep free trade because it's a good thing for the economy, if you, have a, if you, if you put a high probability that instead that is due to the interest groups that want free trade, then uh, you might as well go for the most protectionist uh, type of commitment. Okay? So to tell you a little bit about where you find some of these arguments, here is a slide on, on the first step. So I have a few papers with, with Guizzo and others. One studying the, the, the so both about the link between, between sorry, crisis and distrust. First looking at the globalization crisis within, uh, within and outside the Euro zone. And then looking at most, most recently about the, at the financial crisis, which had the additional important effect of involving in the distrust also the middle class, which became, therefore, uh, a powerful source of incentives for politicians to shift to populist strategies. Uh, about the second step, logically, from uh, distrust to commitment, I want to emphasize three things uh, on top of what I've said before. One thing is that we can see in the, in the, in the paper on financial drivers of populism that there, is, there are these trends, both on the demand side, namely from voter survey, you can see how the demand for commitment went up, but also on the supply side, after the financial crisis, when, as I said, the middle class got involved because of the restrictions to, to borrowing, etc. Uh, there you see that uh, about half of the parties that existed until 2008 either die and are replaced by populist parties or change their name and change their manifesto. You can check the manifesto data in, uh, in, from, the, from the Berlin WZB uh, data set and you will see. You, and, and that's what we do. We document it as descriptively. Okay? And the final bullet point of this slide tells you that if uh, one of the frequently asked questions is why is it the case that in Europe in this wave populism is mostly on the right Whereas in the past, there were much more uh, examples of populism on the left. In part, I believe this, the, this is an economic reasoning, because now we are in a world in which uh, debt ceilings are, are very easy to touch. So many countries are close to, to what could be defined as a debt ceiling. The perception, therefore, is that there is very little fiscal space. And what we document, again, in that paper is that when the fiscal space is particularly tight, people do not believe that indeed it is credible that a populist commitment to protect with expensive citizenship income or alike is, is, is going to go through. And therefore they don't get traction. Whereas something like protection of identity, uh, which is a typical type of protection that would be proposed rhetorically on the right, is cheap and, doesn't, and is not restricted by, uh, by restrictions in fiscal space. Okay. So keeping those things in mind, let me go to the third step. Because now, remember, in the definition, I told you that you should keep together 
the anti-elite rhetoric, the pro-people rhetoric, and the commitments. And here is the story. If you focus on the, on the shift that this trust uh, forced us to force politicians to, to, to go through rationally, namely offering commitments. So if you go to co if you focus first on the commitment step, then once you accept that a politician primarily a populist politician primarily is choosing a commitment strategy, at that point it becomes a completely rational complementary strategy that of going anti-elite because basically you want to argue that your opponent, who is not a populist, is going to be captured by, uh, by the elite, and therefore you want, to, uh, you want to dissuade the voters of the opponent to actually turn out and vote for them. You want to reduce their, their trust. You want to increase their doubts. And other channels to which you, want to inc you can increase their doubts is through fake news production, through uh, campaigns of disinformation uh, that, allows, that doesn't allow the voters to, uh, to, to learn. Uh, as much as they, that they maybe would like about who is good, who is bad, who is right, who is wrong. And similarly, anti-media, anti-bureaucracy um, positioning makes complete sense because the, 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 the bureaucracy, especially expert bureaucrats, might uh, speak and act against the commitment made ex ante by committed populists, and therefore weakening the bureaucracy means weakening the opposition to the stated commitments that will help re-election. And similarly, if the media, expert media, are uh, likely to detect things that, are, that no longer make sense, or maybe they didn't even make sense at the beginning, in terms of commitment, you want people not to trust their, uh, their stories. Okay? And therefore, by the way, this is a side result. Um, uh, when people think about uh, voters being uninformed, and, people, uh, and when you hear someone say that populism is about voters not being informed, voters being, having some, some, high, some kind of cognitive difficulties, I'm totally against that story. Because I believe that it is rational for voters in a context in which there is a lot of supply of noise and supply of disinformation and supply of, uh, of, of, of confusion, it is natural for voters to actually stop getting engaged into, into information acquisition, because information acquisition becomes more costly. Okay? So these are the, the, all the steps that you need to, to understand that this commitment is pervasive. And now we can talk about, if I'm on the right slide, about commitment has consequences. Right? So commitment has consequences. What consequences did I study first? First, as I argued, one thing that I quickly uh, thought that, that should be right for sure if the commitment story holds is that indeed you want to weaken, once you are in office, those who could step against your commitments. And at the, at the public management level, at the, uh, the level of the you know, state management of policies, these are the, the high-level bureaucrats. And think about Trump being uh, stopped by some judges uh, about his border policy closures, etc. And therefore, we should observe, we, sh we, sh we should have first a theory that under what conditions this firing of bureaucrats and even the hiring of, of incompetent bureaucrats is an equilibrium. And that's what we do in the paper with Greg Sasso. And then uh, we wanted to get a first uh, uh, impression about the, the the quantitative uh, dimension of this effect. And so to study this direct effect uh, with the uh, paper for coming on the American Journal of Political Science, what we do is we, we take 8,000 uh, uh, municipality data points for 20 years of municipal elections in Italy, and we compare the, the economic performance and performance vis-a-vis -vis the, the bureaucrats in municipalities where a populist barely made it to office, compare it, comparing it with, uh, with the same outcomes for municipalities where a populist barely lost election. It's called the regression discontinuity design uh, approach. And doing that, what we show is that indeed uh, uh, having a populist in office in this large data set uh, creates uh, 
increased problems of debt because of course if you have to keep the commitments on top of whatever of whatever else uh, the, the, the events allow, uh, make you need to do, you have to keep those commitments so you, you run more debts. And uh, you, there are more uh, cost overruns in procurement contracts. And as I uh, conjectured, indeed it's true and it's quite dramatic that there is a lot of forcing and firing out of good, of good men, of good bureaucrats and uh, hiring of, of mediocre ones such that in fact there is a visible and immediate jump down in the, in the percentage of graduates uh, in, the, in the public bureaucrats of, at the municipality levels. And of course, this study can be replicated at all country levels if, if, whenever, whenever the data are of a, of a similar quality. For once, this Italian data is pretty good. Um, so, but now, these are the, di the direct costs. And this is where, in a sense, the, the, I was more, more, most confident. But now we, we have to be a little bit speculative, uh, following the same logic, what are the, 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 the most the, the kind of broader consequences, as, as Adam was saying, not only in terms of economics, but also in terms of social and political consequences. And so this slide tells us that one potential thing to worry about is the polarization slash illiberal reforms vicious circle. Why is, this, is there this potential vicious circle? Because as soon as a populist comes to office with some commitments and those commitments lead to some reduction of checks and balances in order to have no problems in implementing those commitments, those illiberal reforms typically are unpopular on half, with half of the population and this generates polarization. Uh, and you see polarization in many counties where you have populists, uh, descriptively. But, at the, but once polarization is in place, and as you know, there are millions of papers telling us how polarization is super high and at, at, a, at the maximum level in the US and many Western countries. So when polarization is high, I argue that it's actually more likely to continue on the path of illiberal populism. Why? Here's the intuition. The intuition is this. Think of a trade-off, right? So a majority group, so to speak, is in power and is thinking about the, the, the cost and benefit of doing an illiberal reform that shuts down the opposition from policymaking on all possible aspects. The trade-off, what is it? Well, in the short run, if, the, if you have a reduction of checks and balances and you are in power, you have a benefit because you can do your commitments, you can do your policies and, uh, and shut down the opposition. In the long run, it may be bad because at some point, the voters, if you are remaining in a democracy, uh, of course, a big if, uh, the, the voters may switch and the party that is now in a majority will be in a minority. Okay, and this, by the way, and this switch, when you do an illiberal reform, is less likely, so that has to be taken into account in the theory. But in any case, this trade-off between short-term benefit and long-run cost uh, has greater weight on the short-term benefit when? Well, when uh, the, 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 the government is populist because the, the value of maintaining the commitment has a high political reward and return. And therefore, if there is any chance that maintaining checks and balances weaken the ability to perform the commit, to, to implement the commitments, then you, know, you put higher weight on the short term benefit. And second, polarization itself makes it more salient to shut down the opposition, because polarization means that the people in the majority hate more, so to speak, the, the stances of those in the opposition who would be against the majority, the majority commitments. Okay? So this polarization, uh, illiberal reforms, vicious circle is something to keep in mind. I'll, I'll go back to it. Uh, there is a paper by Funky and, and et al. Uh, that in the tradition of the Dorbush Edwards macro uh, analysis of the consequences of populism, extends their, 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 uh, their work by, by showing on a, on, a, on a long time series that there is at least uh, you know, correlational and, and descriptive evidence that says that uh, populism in office, especially when, when populists in office stay for, for long enough, has big uh, negative consequences 
also on the macroeconomy, not just on the micromanagement that I told you before, uh, but the nationalism and protectionism on average uh, uh, br bring about some negative consequences, and, and also the unsustainable fiscal policies that you needed, at, as, especially, as I said, on the left side of the populist spectrum, uh, 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 generate you know, debts and uh, hyperinflation, etc. So these, these macro things are, are, are still there, um, but as I, as I said, I focused more on the micro thing, but I just wanted to mention that these are obviously other things that people have been working, about, uh, working on. But I'm worried about the future, and so I also want to ask myself, but what about the continuing costs of populism even after populists leave office? Because you might say, well, after a while, like in the Dorbush Edwards story, etc., well, after a while, maybe voters will figure out that, that these uh, commitments have been costly, there have been consequences, maybe they see the macro consequences, and maybe eventually, you know, you want to boot, you want to get rid of the populist. But obviously, one, one thing that we, we noticed in this uh, uh, journey that I, that I made you go through is that trust matters at the very beginning of the story, right? And therefore, even when uh, Trump leaves office in 2020, you still have lingering effects the social and political polarization caused even at the exit by Trump is still there in the US, and now you have polarized this trust. And in fact, in 2022, uh, the, the number of Republican <laughs> candidates who ran on a, on a, on a, on a uh, promise-type campaign and, and Trumpian-type campaign actually increased with respect to 2020. So the polarized distrust makes, it makes us think that the, the, the polarization cycle I, told, I, I mentioned before can actually uh, be part of the creation of also a distrust uh, circle, distrust vicious circle. And, and this is something that, of course, is not easy to revert because trust evolves slowly. Um, crisis of democracy, right? So consistent with what I just told you, it's almost uh, regardless of whether populists are in office or not across countries, almost regardless of that, the, the ratings of countries in terms of their democratic level went down in the last few years. The Economist Intelligence Unit re records this uh, index that looks at the electoral pro process pluralism, uh, participation, political culture, functioning of the state, and uh, importantly, civil liberties, and it started counting this fr starting from 2006, and that index across countries and on average is at a historical minimum, okay? So therefore, the, this trend of distrust uh, in representative democracy is not something that changes the moment Trump leave, uh, leaves office. Uh, labor market threats, what do they do? So I mentioned already that, of course, immigration crisis and uh, immigration fear by workers and uh, uh, the trading with countries that pay workers low wages, etc., cetera, uh, created one of the initial fears at the beginning of the century for sure that generated distrust or at least in the manufacturing sector. But they do something more, this labor market threat, uh, augmented by the technological changes that lead to think that automation could be another threat. So this labor market threat increase what I call, or what we call in political economy, the salience of this, uh, of this uh, kind of external threat issues. The salience of the immigration issue has increased dramatically. And the problem is that on top of, therefore, the overall distrust that I mentioned before, when you add to that the salience of, of a, and you create a lot of one issue, single, single issue voters, then again, it's pretty difficult to avoid the polarization. It's pretty difficult to, to break those other circles. And in particular, we show that in a paper with uh, Matteo Gamaleri and Margherita Negri, that especially countries that use plurality rule, 
uh, and with respect to instead, uh, you know, much more than counties that use proportional representation or, or, or runoffs, uh, have a, a tendency to make those single issue dimensions pivotal and indeed the closing borders and closing access type of policies on top of the liberal reforms are more likely. So those are all the threats that are difficult to revert. I briefly recap also the bureaucracy vicious circle, uh, the, the third one. I mentioned it before, but I want to stress that not only when a populist is in office, he, has in, he or she has incentive to fire the good bureaucrats and, re, and replace them with, with uh, loyal bureaucrats. But there is a future effect of that, is that, well, once uh, the bureaucracy has been weakened, then even, for example, the reforms that uh, the EU wants us to do, the PNRR, Next Generation EU, even doing reforms is more difficult with a more inefficient bureaucracy. And so even the functioning of those reforms doesn't, it doesn't make us uh, uh, think uh, well about the future. And there are some colleagues of mine at, at Columbia University and, and Stanford who are working on, on this in particular on what they call organizational capacity during a reform phase. So as, a, as an example of the fact that populists are completely aware of this circle and they and they kind of strategically use this circle for their future prospects, you can see this quotation from uh, Trump when he announced that he will run again in 2024. What he says is that one of the commitments he makes for in case he is elected uh, is that he will make the, the president of the United States able to fire all possible bureaucratic hurdles the deep state must come to heal. With statements like this, you can see that the, the weakening of the bureaucracy is not a coincidental byproduct, but it's part of the strategy. Finally, you have another circle that you probably have experienced, the emigration vicious circle. Because if you think about the voice and exit framing of Hirschman, you know, if you, if you let the intelligentsia, the human capital, leave the country uh, where the populace doesn't want anybody to stop the commitment, then of course the remaining pop uh, population is less likely to uh, raise efficient voice against them. So the exit voice is activated in that way. And also on the immigration side, countries that are, have implemented illiberal reforms are less attractive to uh, high-skilled immigrants who have a choice about where to go. And therefore, having implemented illiberal reforms actually uh, makes you remain with a with the flow of immigrant demanders that are actually low skill, and this confirms the narrative that immigrants are a threat. So the whole thing is in equilibrium. So as you, as you can see in summary, this po po polarization circle, the trust circle, the bureaucracy circle, and this uh, migration circle are probably just a few examples of the fact that these populism trends are self-reinforcing and they're difficult to revert. So therefore, now let me focus on what can we do. This is the slide on uh, reverting the populism trends. Yes? Yes. So, so as I said, as I, so I tried to give you the message that the Dorbush Edwards story that, OK, once they make a mistake, they're out, is not really comforting because all these circles are still there. I don't think populism is gone. Okay? But what can we do to, if we think that those, po those consequences of populism are damaging? You know, I, I, we do think, or in my team, that certainly both the public management cost and the polarization cost uh, are, are very real and tangible and identifiable. 
and we believe also in the results of others about the macro consequences, etc. No reason why, why not. So there are bad consequences. What, what should we do? Well, the, the recipe that you probably discussed in the, during the talk with Sergei uh, is basically fighting populism on its own turf with communication strategies, fact-checking, social media attempts to reduce social polarization, all fine and good, but the problem is twofold. At the, at the one level, some people think that it's not very effective to fighting populism on its own turf. I have, an, I have a paper where we study one case in which it is, but not always. And uh, second, the problem is that once the, the, you believe the story that um, voters are, in any case, uh, constructing their narratives, as Adam Seidel's talk will, uh, uh, talk will, uh, will convince you even more about, um, that, that is sustainable uh, in equilibrium, in fact, then trying to insist on the opposite narrative is not likely to win because the, the, the alternative realities world that Adam will describe to you is something that exists no matter how much you insist on the, on the, on the realities that you want to describe. Okay? And therefore, my proposition is, is completely the opposite. My proposition is, no, we should not fight populists on their own turf. We should actually fight populists on the turf where they're weakest. And what is the turf where they're weakest? Well, I'm arguing in the next two slides, and then I will conclude, or three, maybe maximum three slides, so maybe I'll, I'll be here. OK, allow me. <laughs> but OK, so what I'm arguing is that the two types of, of, of objectives that we should keep in mind are anti-nationalist rhetoric or anti-nationalist nationalist platforms, and long-term oriented platform. Why? Well, in general, in, at a time in which challenges are global, you know, climate change, COVID, of course, was one of them, and, and, and in fact, the geopolitical threats of Russia and China. So there are lots of global, <coughs> global threats, right? Changing the, the, the uh, global warming, etc. In the face of those global threats, it's pretty clear to most people that, nationaliz that nationalism in the form of autarky is going to be is going to create trouble because we need cooperation in the response to those global challenges. And also on the short term versus long term, you know, populists are very strong in terms of what they promise in the short term, but they don't focus at all on the long term. So once again, if, you, if in general you, you kind of uh, take the high road and offer non-nationalist and non-short-term policies, uh, you let the voters choose what they want from their, for their life, but you don't go on their own turf. So I, I take exactly the opposite uh, uh, point of view. And, and I wrote about this nationalism trap. I wrote a little piece about how this nationalism trap emerges endogenously, given the other characteristics of populism. And I can stress that the, the nationalist anti-European uh, stances of populists happened both during booms and during busts. Right? During good phases, the, the rhetoric is, oh, we should, uh, like the Northern League or, 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 the, or the populist movements in Barcelona, we should take our own profits for ourselves. Why should we give the money to others? And so the secessionists and so on uh, have, were already high rhetorics before. But on top of that, during crisis, now it's even easier because you can blame, you can do the blaming game, and you can use the anti-elite and the xenophobic rhetoric to blame others for the crisis. And, 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 uh, and so in both booms and busts, the nationalism type of stances are typical of populists. And as I said, we should emphasize the fact that this type of nationalism uh, policies are not that great when the, global ch when the challenges are mostly global. We should exploit that, and the EU should take a direct uh, role, in, uh, as it did with the next generation EU, to show to the people that there is something else out there rather than just uh, another layer of European bureaucracy that, is, that, that, they, that they should simply distrust. So the, 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 the trust should come from the top, in my view. So let me give you some uh, specific policy recommendations that I would feel making 
to especially European politicians, but also making aware national politicians about the fact, about the importance of the debate about these things. So as you know, there is a debate about taxation. So there is a debate about fiscal union, and in particular, there is a debate about whether it's good or bad to have a European level capital tax or a corporate sales tax that would cut uh, uh, profits of, of the multinational companies like Amazon, that like now they don't pay taxes, etc., etc. And I want to emphasize that on top of the pros of having such centralized European capital taxes or corporate sales taxes or even wealth taxes per se, because perhaps they are more equitable, perhaps we make more, the, more of the people who make real money pay their taxes. So, so beside the sort of you know, equality-driven reasonings of the Piketty group uh, uh, and, and, and other important groups that, that worry about equality a lot, on top of those things, you also have a potential for, for resuscitating uh, a sentiment that goes against populism. Because once it's the European level that taxes the big companies, overall, if you shift... Uh, if you, keep, if you keep the total amount of tax revenue needed in Europe fixed, this could allow, in principle, the national uh, ministers of finance across nations to actually reduce uh, taxes on uh, disposable income, to increase disposable income for people from, labor, from the labor forces in particular. And therefore, this could actually make the, the workers feel uh, uh, that indeed the, the, the institutions, uh, maybe not the national institutions, but the European institutions, are helping to improve their, uh, their, their situations and, 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 and reduce economic insecurity. The second dimension still about pu public finance is investment. As we, as we know uh, from the, from, from the post-COVID crisis, etc., people do tend to appreciate uh, investments in infrastructures, investments in public health, investments in, in, uh, in things that the nations w by themselves would not be able to, to do. And, and this, uh, again, it's another route that should be taken because all, all infrastructures and this type of things are long term and populists are, are, have a hard time uh, contrasting those but, and, and making commitments on those, in fact, for reasons that are a bit mysterious. Okay, so. Then uh, the, um, the other route, of course, is, uh, is defense, right? So we, we should, as an example, especially when the global challenge that we can think about is the geopolitical challenge related, for, for example, to all the fears uh, 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 by, on, caused by the Russian invasion, etc. Well, now people are, on, on, the, on the surveys, uh, uh, converging on the necessity of a European defense. So all these uh, tendencies should shift the, the, the attention, even of voters, on more cooperative type of policies. So to conclude, what is the message of this public lecture? The message is, on the one hand, is, is a pessimistic message, in the sense that I told you a lot of those vicious circles that are difficult to eradicate, <coughs> and that make me think that populism is not immediately going away even if people see the consequences for in terms of policy. On the other hand, the, 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 the opportunity that we have ahead of us is given by the same very fact that we face a lot of challenging global problems. Because these challenging global problems should create what uh, Jean Monnet would think of as the next step in the chain reaction theory. Right? These global challenges, not faceable by individual countries, could bring about the final step of the fiscal and political union in Europe. And so my, my dream, in fact, putting everything together, is that we fight against the tendency of, of reduced representative democracy at the national level. Uh, we fight it with a, with a quest by all politicians and intelligentsias to actually have more representative democracy at the European level, such that not only the cooperation is easier, but sometimes the cooperation is easier 
is easiest, in fact, if a policy is decided by the, by the Commission, right? Like trade policies are. But those things, like the Trade Commission, would be effective in, in changing a trade policy because they don't have to go to the Council of Europe, but, it doesn't, that, but what they do does not create trust. Because, in fact, it's easy to believe for those who have a narrative that free trade agreements are, are, are determined by, by the elites, etc., that even the commission is taken. And so it's not, the, it's not giving more, more competencies to, to the commission that is going to change the trust. Giving more competencies to the commission may have short-term economic benefits because you do quickly things. But in terms of reducing the trust, uh, reducing the distrust, and hence uh, recuperating the, 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 a, a kind of uh, good relationship between voters and, and, and politics, okay, that requires actually political representation. That would require, in my dream world of the United States of Europe, a proportional representation system where, in fact, people feel represented on top of feeling that the elected institutions through that system will be able to achieve those, uh, those better functioning uh, global answers to the global challenges. I'm done. Thank you.